During this extraordinary time, SoCal Gas is dedicated to protecting the health and safety of our customers, our employees, and the communities we serve. A large part of that effort is to ensure that important information reaches people when they need it most. As a longtime partner of the OC Forum, we have worked with the administration and UCI to postpone our regularly scheduled luncheon and present a virtual program with open access. Hi, I'm Rick Reef, Editor-at-Large of the Orange County Business Journal, and for the next hour and a half, we'll hear from top local medical experts, business leaders, community leaders, and public officials examining how this coronavirus is impacting Orange County. Now, this is an OC Forum event, and uh, it's by uh, necessity being the mother of invention, our first virtual event ever. And uh, for 30 years, the OC Forum has provided timely information about important topics seen through an Orange County prison, uh, a prism, a place where concerned citizens can hear experts, leaders, and newsmakers. Now, if you or your company would like to become a member of the Orange County Forum, check out our website at ocforum.org. Thank you to UC Irvine for providing the Cove uh, as, the, uh, uh, as the site of our virtual forum. Pretty fitting, uh, the Cove is a uh, business incubator uh, with a focus on high tech and biomed, and I imagine there's entrepreneurs uh, working at the Cove who could very well be part of the solution to this coronavirus. We'd also like to thank our event sponsor, SoCal Gas, and so let's get going. Uh, the coronavirus is a black swan event that has impacted and will continue to impact our lives like nothing we've seen in a generation. So let's begin with the science and health. We have with us Bernadette Bowden Albala, the Dean of Public Health with UCI, Dr. Stephen Goldstein, Vice Chancellor of Health Affairs at UCI, and Dr. Susan Huang, Medical Director of Epidemiology and Infection Prevention with UCI Health. Just to be brief about it, you're all doctors, you're all administrators, you're all experts on disease, so any of you can handle any of these questions, and I'm sure, you know, feel free to, to uh, you know, to, to add, add whatever you want to every question. Um, uh, but I'd like to start with you, uh, Dr. Goldstein, and just kind of a silly question, but one that's, uh, you know, I think about a lot. We've, we're, we all see this iconic picture of what the coronavirus looks like, and it's sort of a gray Nerf ball with these, you know, little soft red spikes sticking out. Is, is that just a model, or is that like a real photo of, of a coronavirus, I'm just, or, or an enhanced photo? Well, it, it depends which one you're looking at, but in point of fact, electron microscopy allows us to see the viral particles themselves. So it may be that it's an enhanced image with colors that aren't really there, but it's called a coronavirus because the spikes that are there uh, reminded the people who were first studying the virus of a crown or a corona. Okay, I don't know if I solved any bar bets with that. The answer is yes. It's, it's close enough to reality, but it is enhanced so that okay. it right. has greater emotional All impact. All right, and, and, and another, um, uh, another real simple question. We are being told that uh, we should wash our hands with soap and water mm. all the time. Uh, Bernadette, why is that so important? It's important because it's the way to basically kill the virus. And the proper way to wash your hands is soap, 20 seconds rubbing with water. And um, if you have hand sanitizer with 60% or more alcohol, that's fine as well. You want to wash your hands as much, as often as you possibly can, before and after you do but something. But the soap actually kills the yes. virus, right? Yes, it does. If I can it jump in, it. that yeah. picture shows spikes coming out of a round ball. That round ball is a lipid membrane. Lipids are dissolved by soap. Okay, so, so the are... soap kills, now, until this, I've always been kind of more of a, just a water guy, you know, I'll wash <laughs> my hands with water. Does that do any good? 
No, you really do need something that's going <laughs> yes. to kill the virus. Okay. And, so and, and just doing best, water, that doesn't yeah, do it. Yeah, that's not going to help you. And the best thing to do for hand hygiene is the one that's convenient and there. So if you have access to a sink with soap, if you have access to alcohol hand rub, that's what you should use. Okay, so, but the sanitizer also kills the, uh, yes, uh, absolutely. does the trick. Okay, and uh, hot or cold water, does it make a difference? It doesn't, although if you have very scalding water, it can actually damage your skin, and then you open up areas of your skin that are actually uh, more vulnerable. So but cold water works uh, fine? Yes, yeah. as long as you use the alcohol okay. or the soap component. And why is it so important to self-isolate or to, you know, keep a, 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 a self-distance? I think there's two reasons. So one is, so what we're gonna stop the spread, we're gonna stop the transmission of the virus. And so one of the key ways that this virus is spread is um, through bodily fluids. So you sneeze, you cough, you spit. And so you wanna keep the distance so that when you sneeze, cough, or spit, or somebody does that, that you're not, that the other person doesn't get that on them and then inadvertently, I just did it, touch your face, touch your eyes, touch your mouth, where you would end up with the virus. And I guess that's the other point, maybe it's obvious, but the reason you wash your hands, you don't have to wash your hair and everything else, is your hands are what's gonna to touch your eyes, your ears, your mouth, and, yes. and all that. Okay, all right, great. The number one question we're getting from viewers is, where do I go to be tested? Dr. Huang, do you want Susan? to answer that? The testing is an evolution. Um, the staffing are there, the machines are there, the reagents are not. Um, so until the chemicals are in high volume to be able to handle the amount of people who would like to be tested, um, most of us are um, rationing the testing for the very ill. So the answer is you don't go anywhere right now to be tested? There are places that are open to be tested. Um, the turnaround time is getting longer and longer as m more people have tried to get tests. And again, the turnaround time will continue to expand nationally because of the national shortage for testing. And Susan, wouldn't you say, as we've been saying to people, if you're not feeling well, go home, s distance yourself. If you're feeling really, really poor, call your doctor. Don't go to yes, your doctor. Absolutely. Call your doctor and then ha arrange with the staff based upon the symptoms right. how they will see you. And if the symptoms are very, very bad, then you need to make sure that that's imparted to the physician or to go to an emergency room. And, and if the physicians feel that you need to get tested, they will then recommend testing. And UCI is embracing telehealth, um, like many other um, types of business environments, to try to not only um, get to patients in time, to be able to visually see them, talk to them, make them feel like there's a real physician-patient interaction, and to direct them either to stay home um, if they're contagious or to bring them in if they need to be seen for whatever reason that they need to be cared for. Yeah, when, when you said, Dr. Juan, that people don't have to you know, I, or that they can't go in right now to be tested. I could imagine a lot of viewers, you know, getting, getting nervous. I guess the question would be, is it important to get tested? Well, that's, that's why talking to the physician first is gonna be critical because the limited number of tests that are there need to be applied to those who we are worried about. Um, and indeed, you can then make an appointment for the drive-by testing that's become available um, but the delay in uh, the feedback on that testing is what is, cre is the problem with the reagent right. limitation. So th the staying in touch with your physician is key. And, and maybe and I, the, oh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and you, you can add to this, I think, Susan, we're particularly worried about the vulnerable populations. We're particularly worried about older people. We're particularly worried about people who have other pre-existing lung and other what we would call comorbidities, heart disease, diabetes. Those people are at really added risk. And so if you were one of those people and then you ended up with these symptoms, you would be more likely to be recommended to have testing done. And okay, there's uh, maybe a reason why not to be tested. So if you're, you have no symptoms whatsoever, you should not be tested. That test is not going to be helpful for you. If you have mild symptoms, it's not a hall pass to go out into society because you don't have that illness, you have something else. So if you have a viral illness and you're coughing and you're sneezing, you should not be in society no matter what type of cold virus um, or flu um, that you have. So it's not to distinguish between those who can socialize and those who cannot. It's really intended to help decision-making for 
patients who might need to be in clinical trials or patients who might need to come into the hospital and receive treatment. Okay, uh, Dr. Bowden Albala, yes. you said uh, call a physician if you're not feeling well. How about somebody that doesn't have a physician? Is there someplace else they can call? I think that there's a number of different um, self-help, or not really self-help, medical lines, and UCI has a number of them that people can call, and then they can be triaged. I don't have them with me, but we can certainly put them up. Okay, Dr. Goldstein, there's been, uh, you, uh, you might have heard there's a Pew study that just came out that shows a majority of Americans think that the coverage of the coronavirus has been exaggerated. We're making too much of it. And, uh, you know, there are others on the other extreme. We haven't acted fast enough. We wasted uh, valuable days, and it's going to be worse than, than we think. Give, a, give us a sense, what's, what's the best case, worst case scenario, uh, you know, uh, on this, and try to quantify it for us. Um, I'll, I'll defer a, a bit to uh, Professor Bowden Abala on, on the numbers, but I think that what we are trying to do is avoid what we have seen happen in China when there was poor social distancing at the outset. At the outset, the patients who were getting sick were getting very sick, and that's because they didn't know how to take care of them, and then they overwhelmed their hospital system, so they were unable to take care of them. And what we're trying to do now is decrease the rate at which people get ill so we can take care of those who need it. Um, so we've all seen numbers that go from hundreds of thousands to millions of people who could be uh, ill, and as Dr. Fauci has said uh, from the NIH, that range is still possible, and the question is how effective we are at slowing so it. So what's, what's the range, best case to worst case? I don't even want to yeah. give numbers. I would just say that, you know, some, some people are suggesting that at the end of this, 70 percent of people will have had COVID-19. And can we expect that in Orange County, that 70% of us so, are going so to get... So there is no real reason to expect that if we do nothing, that that would not be the number. Okay. That's correct. Well, if, if, if you're now, reluctant to give a number... Oh, go ahead. Well, so I, so I think that as, um, as, as Steve was talking about, there's this whole concept that everyone's been talking about, which is flattening the curve. And what we really want to try to do there is slow down the person-to-person -person spread so that when somebody gets in trouble with this, and again, probably only 20% of people are really going to be ill enough to be hospitalized, most people it's going to be mild to a really bad flu-like syndrome, if you will. Um, so the first thing is we, we have to stop. We can't be, we have to understand what's going on, but we also can't be so fearful that we freeze and that we panic. So flattening the curve means that we, we, we slow transmission down so that even though people get it, mm -hmm. they get it and we can respond to it. So we can take care of the people that get very sick and that we can keep the people who are sick but to stay home, staying home. Susan, yeah. do you want to and add the, something? And I think the goal is, in the end of the day, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and it's because what we're aiming for is a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is we need to protect the frail and the vulnerable and the elderly, and we need to protect them from getting COVID-19 until they can get the vaccine. And if we can build the population immunity slowly right. among the young, the healthy, who can weather it just fine, because it'll be like a bad cold or like yeah. a flu-like illness, and we have to protect the grandparents. We have to protect the elderly. We have to protect those who have chronic illness. So how do you think we're doing so far? I think Orange County has done a really terrific job in slowing down congregation and closing schools. I think all of these measures are actually going to go the distance for us. I think they were smart not to say that a two-week hiatus in school was going to solve all of our problems. I think, like I said, we're a year plus out from a vaccine. We have to go to the distance. We can't be complacent. Um, and yet, on the other hand, we can't be overly fearful. So it's a real, the food banks need to stay open. In fact, I would love, Bernadette, to talk about that. We need to feed the hungry. 
and we can do it safely. Yeah, we need to feed the hungry. We need to feed children who would normally be getting their big su substance for the, for the day as a school lunch. We, we have other problems out there that we cannot ignore because of this. So that's why we say, you know, stay in your home and telecommute if you can, but uh, if you can't, Social distancing becomes critically important. And again, let's keep people six feet. I was at the pharmacy the other day picking something up, and everybody was like crowding around me, and then they handed me a pen that everybody else had been using. And I said, stop, let's move <laughs> back, let's take a deep breath, and let's try to remember that we are in the era of social distancing. Now, that doesn't mean you should stay in your home. Right. In fact, social distancing, I promised I would get this in, does not mean means social isolation, and that's really important. Right now, here in Orange County, with the schools being closed, and I know my faculty are just, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with my children? Um, people are getting used to this, but over the next couple of weeks, this is going to become a little bit more of our new normal, and we're going to have to figure out how to do that well, how to make sure that the homeless are treated well, how to make sure those students, those, those kids get their lunches, how to make sure that the, the, the kids in your home are getting out and screaming and doing all the things that 11-year-olds do or 10-year-olds do, and how to make sure that we are careful with the vulnerable populations and not spreading disease. From what I've been reading, it sounds like the 18-year-olds are having no problem. They're, oh. in, da they're, on, they're in Daytona <laughs> Beach, they're flying the airplanes, they're keeping right. the economy afloat. But That's anyway, a problem. Steve, right. Yes. And two things that come to mind from what we just said. One, uh, Bernadette talked about touching the pen. So if I can bring that all the way back to washing your hands. We're washing our hands because we touch things other people have touched. And the virus can live on something like this for two days. So if we share the pen and then I wash my hands, I've cleansed myself again. So that's, that's right. part of it. The social distancing in terms of being worried about an exaggeration or not, there was a natural experiment in the 1918 influenza um, pandemic. Um, at the start of it, there was an announcement that people should social distance. In the city of Philadelphia, they did not. And if you look at the graph of how many people got sick, there was this giant spike which completely overwhelmed the hospital system. In St. Louis, they listened. They did everything that we're doing now. And the disease was like this. People got sick, but it was at a slow enough level that the healthcare system could take care of the patients. Good. Well, before we move on, I just want to go back to the numbers one more time because you know, there are viewers out there worried about their jobs. In other words, the steps that we're taking now in order to try to flatten the curve and avoid the worst case scenario, is having a tremendous impact on our economy. And we're in a recession. People are losing their jobs. Uh, we'll soon hear from public officials where, you know, it, it appears the finances of government are in real bad shape. We could have cities going bankrupt as a result of this. So people are paying right. a heavy I, price. I will, I, will, I will stop being so careful, all right? Okay, no, all right, okay. Because what I'm trying to do is, uh, please, if we do all these things, what have we saved? Have we saved a million if lives? You, have we saved oh, 10,000 yes. lives? Yes. I mean, what is the, the what are we so doing? If, let's say, I'm not sure I can do all of this in my head. Let's say if 70% of the population gets ill, let's call that 250 million people. Let's say if between five and 10% of that is seriously ill and hospitalized, well now imagine all of those people going towards the hospital. Imagine 1% of those are actually those who die. You're talking about 2 million to 3 million people. Okay, so what we're, and doing everything we can, what's the best we can expect? Uh, at, at the end of the day, if we've really done a good job, Dr. Huang, what is the toll yeah. likely or, so or perhaps? I think Dr. Goldstein mentioned it, it's the rate. 
It's the rate at which it happens. So if you can imagine that if the best, if the, the way that you slow down an epidemic in this case is that 50 to 70% of people have to be immune, you can get there a number of ways. You can either infect everybody at the same time, in which case you have a lot of really sick people, you'll overwhelm the system. You can slow it down so that there's a, a fraction of people who are getting immune slowly over time, ideally not the elderly and not the frail. And, and eventually when the vaccine comes, you catch up the rest right. to 50 to 70 percent with the vaccine. We are in a race to reach the vaccine before those infected groups reach the elderly and the If frail. we manage to do that, how, how uh, let's, uh, let's call that a best case scenario. What would the rough range be, you think, of, uh, of let's just say fatalities? I think it's going to be far less than 1 percent. Which, but that is not comforting if it's your loved one. percent is two million. <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, very high. are we talking it's a high. few thousand yeah. or tens of thousands? Yeah, the, the flu, the flu every year, twenty to forty thousand people die. Twenty. So that to would be 40, a good number if if forty thousand people die as a result of this. That would be about as best as we can expect. If we can prevent all the elderly and all the people who have chronic illness to social distance and stay away from those who are ill, then we can the rest will weather it just fine, and we can drop that death rate to far, okay. far, far below 1%. Okay, thank you. I get, think I, and I, we can I, do that I'll, here in Orange yeah. County. We need to not be complacent, though. We, are, we have a year to go. Right, and I think that's really, really important, not being complacent. So one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Again, I want to go back to this new norm, and I do want to talk about businesses, right? So I think that part, the businesses are going to get hit, and so it's time to be creative. I was yeah. watching the other day that restaurants were now, um, instead of you know having people come in because they really can't come in, were really turning to a lot more um, you know, pickup and takeout. And so I think that that's really important. Um, we, we are going to have to shift some of this if we want to save those, those people and if we want to get to a vaccine quickly. So I think that, um, that Orange County business groups need to get together, not live though, but get together and really think about how we can be creative in this time. Well, actually, we do have a business group getting okay. together live here, <laughs> okay. spaced appropriately okay. as, as we all right. are right, right here. And so that, that will right. be another segment. Right. Uh, so uh, Dr. Goldstein, help us understand you know, we, we see the press conferences, the president's giving press conferences, and the head of CDC is giving his talk. And then, you know, how does it come down to the local level? I mean, is it basically your, we are on the local level receptors of whatever the federal government is, is sending down, or are there a lot of things that go on on the local level where you have discretion, uh, you make decisions, how right. does it all work? Both of those are true. So at, at the local level, it is very important for us to act wisely and in a cohesive fashion across the healthcare system and with the county, and that has been going beautifully. And then across the state, the hospitals and the providers are talking to each other so that we can be aware of the best way to take care, care of the, the California population. But at the same time, the action of the federal government is crucial to releasing um, and helping the localities accomplish their goals. And, and that's everything from supporting the businesses if they're under duress, uh, supporting people who work hourly wages who may not be able to, to make ends meet, to helping change legislation so that we can quickly move potential therapies or t trials of therapies through the system at a rate that it doesn't normally go. On the hospital level or on the local level, let's say you need, you, you know, we need X number of respirators. On the local level, do you go out and get those? Do the hospitals get those? Or does the government, does the state say you get this many respirators? How does that work? The, it is, it is, um, um, that is mainly a local um, uh, level. So what we've done at UCI Health is we say, look at all the respirators we have, look at the ones that we have that are coming in shortly. We work with the, the county to find out what's available. We talk to the other hospitals. So we're all ready and prepared um, uh, for their need, for their increase. Are, are the hospitals cooperating? 
They are indeed. They are indeed okay. through the, the help of the county. Okay, uh, Dr. Huang, a little while ago you mentioned um, uh, the vac vaccines, and now as we speak, there's talk about some vaccines going into trials, and there's, I guess, an existing vaccine that maybe will work really well or something. You know, so bring us. Uh, how how hopeful are you that we're going to find a vaccine, and how long do you think it's going to take? It seems like things are moving rather quickly in that regard. Uh, yes, they're they're working with lightning speed. Of course everything that is tested in a basic science laboratory has to be validated in humans. And so the part that takes the longest time is the sequence is known for this organism. The targets um, are known. Um, the difficulty is then you have to manufacture it. You have to put it into a safe carrier. You have to then test it in small amounts of individuals first and then larger amounts of individuals so you understand the safety profile and how it works. And that's, it, it, a year is lightning fast. It's actually lightning that's, fast. That's what I would say. It, it, is, it is remarkable how quickly we have mobilized. Yeah. The science is happening 10 times faster than you could have imagined it a decade ago. And so we have drug trials that we are trying now with potential agents that have already begun. We have vaccine development. We have new assay development. The, way, the, 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 the speed at which we can move uh, is remarkable because of the strength of technology and science. And, and Rick, I was just going to say there is so much hope that the community who is working on the vaccine that in, you know, in concert with uh, the pharmaceutical industries and um, other tech industries and the government, that we think that we are going to be able to move these vaccines through quickly. And I, so I, I, I want to say hope. There's a lot of hope there. It is very promising. I think we live in this most beautiful community. I'm from New York, if you hadn't figured that out for this accent. Um, and we live in this most beautiful community, this most beautiful county. And one of the things I really find to be just tremendous is community and I think if there even though we have to social distance this six feet it does not mean that we for one minute lose that sense of community and community is all about coming together when times may be harder and really trying to do the right thing so remembering the homeless remembering the children that need food and and really thinking about other ways you know we have robots on campus at UC that are that are that are taking food from Java juice to the dorms. Um, so good things and can people and will are, come and out of this. People are pitching in beautifully. They are. We have medical students who are offering to babysit That's for right. the children of the staff in the right. hospital, so the staff in the hospital can be available. But we have so so people are coming together. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, when speaking of community, there's a community of, of biomedical companies yes. and researchers. Yes scientists at, at UCI and uh, the Orange County Business Journal has just done a story highlighting some of the companies that are involved in research that relate to, uh, you know, a cure for uh, corona, coronavirus. Uh, doctor, give us a sense like at, uh, the things going on here locally in Orange County that you're aware of that are uh, that have potential for helping us helping everybody solve this uh, I, I think each of the domains of taking care of patients well are present here in Orange County. Um, we are uh, the, a lead in medical devices. Medical devices are crucial for when you're very sick or for the assays that we need to do. We are, as a community, working, therefore, on the tests that we need that work rapidly, as opposed to the ones that go slowly and expanding them across the country. We're part of the clinical drug trials of agents that already exist and are known to be safe, and if they have efficacy, then we could move quickly towards something that would be helpful uh, to people. Another thing that's going on that's a broader base is that we're actively in conversations now with major companies, both for-profit and non-profit, about expanding telehealth and telemedicine to everyone in the country country with a potential diagnosis of COVID, and we're working on that on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. So the level of, of, of intellectual energy, the level of collaboration in Orange County, and our reach through the country is really something to be proud of. Well, on uh, 
maybe the, or, well, definitely on the fearful side. Do you have any concerns that this is not going to be the last virus we have to deal with? And is there any reason to believe that it's more than a once in a generation event and that we're somehow in a new age here where we're going to be confronting this type of thing more frequently? I think that the world is a very small place now because of planes, trains, um, all of the access that we can easily reach from very, very far away. For example, at UC Irvine Health, the minute we saw that it was in China, that is right next door. We have flights coming in all the time into Orange County, into LA, as you can see. And so um, we, um, we need to, if, if history serves us well, um, we have over the past short number of years, we've had H1N1, we've had SARS, um, of severe acute respiratory syndrome, we've had Middle East respiratory syndrome, these are coronaviruses, we've had a number of things that come up and, and that, that peter out because they don't do well in humans. So all of us at, um, at the hospital have been planning for years for pandemic planning. We have a full-time person whose job is infectious diseases management, emergency management, in addition to our normal emergency management and our normal infection prevention. And we scale from the very small to the very, very large overrun surge planning to make sure that we can respond to anything and be fairly nimble. Oh, no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna go back to actually Steve's point. Um, so other examples of how we can use our businesses and technology, I mean, I do think that we're gonna end up, there are these re-emerging infectious diseases. So how can our um, companies here, uh, you know, be responsive as the hospital has been responsive? And if we think about a lot of people are doing things online, Zooming, kids need to continue their schooling. So there's a lot of opportunities to rethink the educational climate and atmosphere, to rethink, um, you know, programming to get to people, to, to rethink businesses as being more virtual but not as 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 taking losses but actually in a sense coming up with other things that uh, can help address this situation as we still think about re-emerging infections and I, I do think that you you put your finger on it um, we, we've got an emerging infectious disease initiative across the campus because um, we can list um, every few years something. Zika right. was in the news a few years ago. So the more that we can develop our response strategies, the more we can protect more, um, uh, the population as they come up, because they will, because the organisms continue to evolve and, and, and come at us, and we just have to be better and better at responding. Okay, Dr. Goldstein, we have, I think you would agree, a decentralized healthcare system in the United yes. States, more decentralized perhaps than anywhere else. Uh, is that good or bad in, in dealing with uh, this type of a pandemic? It, 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 the, um, the, the isolation and the capitalistic uh, uh, structure that has made us so successful in advancing Western medicine and pushing forward um, unique solutions and, and caring for people in ways that were unimaginable five, 10, 20 years ago is the strength of the American ingenuity, ingenuity, ingenuity and, um, and the separation allows that creativity. In an event like this, where everyone needs to pull together, we're not necessarily as ready for it. And yet, you see the American ingenuity coming together because we are very quickly turning on a dime and working to work together. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dr. Huang, um, any suggestions on where people can go for information? Uh, is the CDC like the really the best site, or you know, if people want to go online? Uh, uh, what yeah. are the best places to go the, for information? The public health sites are some of the very, very best. Um, they have been messaging for many things, and so they know how to do that well in the language that um, people really readily understand. CDC is outstanding. Orange County Public Health, California Department of Public Health, they all have language that's specific for patients, and they have others for providers and others for health care um, um, or for public health um, people who are trying to 
stave it off that and way. It, and it, our hospitals do as well. Our yeah, hospitals exactly. have patient information. We're pushing out information as quickly as we can. Um, and I just wanted to add to Bernadette's comment about community. You know, I don't want, if you were walking down the hallway or down the street and you saw someone trip and fall, I don't want people to be too scared right. to go and reach out their hand to help that person get back up again. What we need to understand, you're going to go reach for someone who may or may not have a, a respiratory illness. You can figure that out pretty fast if they're coughing. And your hand can be washed. And so we shouldn't be afraid to hug our family members, but we do need to be careful when people have symptoms. They're right. coughing, they're sneezing, they have a fever. We need to really keep them away. But I don't want us to be fearful of helping on the street or helping when someone really needs us, including the homeless shelters, the food banks, the places that we really need to provide care. If I can um, say the, the, the CDC is stupendous. In an Orange County-centric way, the UCI Health website is, speaks about, curates from many of the best sites and then speaks directly to Orange County needs. So it is a good place if, if one is looking for a place to go. And we've done a lot of videos, messaging, blogs that children love for that population, that adults love for another population. And again, going to the UCI website would be, you'd be able to get a lot of that information. And she's a rock star. She's been showing how to wash hands with the-, the With the, Peter the Anteater. Peter the Anteater, so. <laughs> okay, uh, just a couple more quick things. Uh, oh, by the way, a site that I saw, Worldometer, are you familiar with that? Yeah. It's, uh, it it kind of keeps, it's, it's the latest on every country, how many yeah. cases, uh, and, and so on. And it's, it seems to be a pretty good way if, if you're you know, looking at that sort of thing. Uh, and I did notice China now. I mean, is, is the worst over? And have they, are they out of the woods? I mean, if you look at the numbers now, it looks like they, I don't think they've had any new cases uh, today, in the last days. Day. Today, today, there was no deaths. Yeah, I right. think yeah. there were no deaths. So does that mean it's over for them or, or, or what? China's a very large country, um, and things do tend to take its time to go outside of where the epicenter of where this was. I do think that the worst is over in the Wuhan area. Um, they did it the way that we're trying not to do it, which is fast and furious, um, and very much overwhelmed their health system. But yes, in that area, immunity is very high right now. Um, and, but it will still trickle down to the rest of their country. They still have work to do. Okay, and Bernadette, any yeah. word, uh, any word of advice for the, for the young kids? I mean, because I do hear some people complaining that, you know, the millennials or the younger uh, <laughs> folks really aren't. They're not doing what they should be doing, and in a way, they're probably not going to get infected, right? I mean, they're, you know, well, they're, well, gonna they're gonna get infected. <laughs> they're gonna get infected, but I think they're not gonna have symptoms oh. as much, although. Okay. Uh, so, so should what, they just what, go on enjoying no, life and so, kinda, you know, yes, we should go on enjoying life. That, that's the first thing, right? We have to live, we just can't stop. Should they, should they go on enjoying the life that we're seeing in the newspaper? Well, I think that's a small segment of the, of the folks. We've been working, we, with um, students at UCI, there's, you know, 35,000 students at UCI, and they have been out. We've been doing something called pop-up public health, and they've been going around these students and talking to people about public health, about washing your hands, about safe distancing, but still about not being socially isolated, about you know, using other ways to contact and uh, people about helping elderly. So I would say, you know, um, the the students that were getting a lot of uh, press because they're in Florida or on the beaches enjoying themselves and saying that they don't Is that care. Is that not a good thing? I'm, I'm going to have to be a little bit of a curmudgeon. I uh, think no. <laughs> the, beach, the beach is fine as long as you uh, have some distance. But oh, since sure. many of those yeah. young people... Yeah can Our survive groups. this and won't even know that they're ill, yeah. which is fine. But then they're gonna go home to their parents who, and they're gonna go and home to their grandparents, grandparents and they're gonna go home to someone who might be immunosuppressed because they have rheumatoid arthritis or someone who's on cancer chemotherapy. So the fact that they feel fine but are carriers is a challenge. It so is. so we do need to ask them 
to And on be that front, I think that what we're not very good at as humans is we don't speak up when we have a tickle in our throat. We don't speak up when we have the first hint of a sniffle or a cough. We suppress it and we think, oh, it's going to be okay. And if I'm only mildly ill, then everybody else will only be mildly ill. And this is the time that we have to speak up. We have to speak up to protect those around us. If you have an, a, a, someone you're supposed to go meet and you think your throat is a little bit scratchy, this is not the time. Right. And you need to speak up and that is not what we're comfortable with and we need to start to do that. That is working well, that is playing well, that is being, a, a being good in the community right. for everybody else. That's what we need to do. Right now we don't have enough tests, so if you feel that scratchiness, just Right, and again, resistance. whatever you have, we don't want it, whether it is right. COVID-19 or the flu and, or and something thing, else, and we the don't thing, want if it. If things are changing day by day and week by week, we will have enough tests. Yeah. We have to just be careful until we're there. Okay, right. doctors, thanks so Thank much you. for your a great you. discussion and for all of your insight. Now we're gonna step aside for a few minutes, uh, wash our hands, among other things, <laughs> and with soap, with, with soap and water. With and soap. when we get back, we're gonna be seconds. talking to two <laughs> public officials with important roles in this crisis. Dr. Alma Harris, the superintendent of schools for Orange County and third district county supervisor, Don Wagner. Well, hi, welcome back to the Orange County Forum's panel discussion on coronavirus. Once again, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, UC Irvine, who's hosting us here at The Cove, as well as our event sponsor, SoCal Gas. Joining me now are County Supervisor Don Wagner and soon to take his seat, Orange County Superintendent of Schools, Al Harris. So Al, you're probably on a tight schedule, a lot, lot, lot to do for now, right? Well, gentlemen, thanks. Uh, we're now going to get a, uh, we're going to hear about how things are going on the local level. So, uh, Supervisor Wagner, what's, what's happening locally in well, government? Well, Rick, uh, good to be with you. Wish the circumstances were different, and thank you to um, uh, UCI for hosting the uh, teleseminar today. What's going on? Well, we yesterday put out a new revised county uh, health directive. It is an order from the senior public health director, uh, Dr. Quick, here in the county. And what it is doing is um, pretty much following the governor's recommendations, which are shutting down our bars, shutting down the dine-in component of restaurants, obvious places where people congregate, shutting down movie theaters, health clubs, and gyms. Again, obvious. Uh, steps to to make sure that we stem the spread to the extent possible. We are also encouraging but not requiring that businesses practice social distancing that was discussed in the prior panel. We are requesting but not requiring businesses to permit telecommuting where possible. And so what we're asking is the public and people that are out interacting in public, do it responsibly, follow the steps that were outlined quite well by the prior panel of doctors. Uh, at the same time, as was said by one of the doctors, we're encouraging to the extent possible within those parameters, life go on. We don't want to shut down the economy completely because we realize that a valuable and functioning economy is going to help us get through this. It's going to provide for services. It's going to provide for paycheck income that's going to help, they're going to help people get through the, the system. So take a look at the county's website to see the new order, but we are not shutting down all business in Orange County. We are just asking, be responsible and help your friends, help your neighbors. So the, um you know, as you know, you took some heat, or the county did, for the first order that went out that some businesses were, you know, it, it sounded like everything was going to shut down. Was that just one of those things when, uh, you know, you're starting something and mistakes happen? Um, mistakes do happen, and I was quoted in, in one of the, the news sources as saying it was poorly drafted. It was. It could have been read in ways that 
Dr. Quick assures us was not intended, and that was essentially to shut down all non-essential businesses. That is an over-reading of the original order. The new order makes it clear that we are not trying to shut down non-essential businesses. We are, in fact, encouraging people to do business, but to do it in a responsible manner. Okay, and uh, j one other thing. The, 20, uh, the, the hotline, the county has a hotline. It's from eight to eight. Uh, shouldn't it be 24 hours? It, it should be, and it's going to be shortly. Just uh, recently, the uh, county's emergency operations center has gone to 24 hours. The hotline will follow. And let me, if I can, let me give out the number. There are a couple of numbers that folks should know have available that will help. The emergency operations center's hotline number is 714-628-7085. We are looking to man that 24 hours a day. The county's health referral line is an 800 number. It's 800-564-8448. And finally, if you need in-home supportive services, the number there is 714-825-3000. Say those numbers, call them if necessary, but realize together, we're all getting through this. Yeah. What services is the county providing or can it provide to people who need some help? Well, it depends on the particular help that is needed. Right now, we are encouraging uh, restaurants, for example, to, since they can't do dine-in services, to make sure that they have available takeout, was mentioned in the earlier panel. Um, if you need social supported services, I got another number for you. It's another 800 number. 800-281-9799. Those uh, hotlines are available. Those will help you uh, navigate the, um, uh, these uncertain times. The state of California has got a website that gives you information on COVID-19, uh, but also goes a little bit beyond that. Some of the services that are available, Medi-Cal, CalFresh, that website is uh, www covid19 no dashes no breaks covid19.ca.gov so the resources are out there depending on what you need uh, go on to the county's site go on to the state site call one of these referral services we will get the help to you that you need and one of the things i said in our press conference yesterday is that we were hearing that we are the help until help arrives, let's broaden that. We're in, we're in tough times, but we're all in it together. We're in times that are increasingly polarized politically. This is an opportunity to break down those political barriers, help yourselves, help your friends, help your neighbors, and the county is trying to stay uh, as ahead of this as possible to help all of our citizens. Dr. Meharis, yes. uh, uh, education is so important in Orange County. In fact, uh, when, when the county did a, uh, a webinar recently on this, that seemed to be the question all the viewers wanted to know, is my school going to be open, you know, and that sort of thing. Well, now they're, they're all closed, right, K through 12? All the schools are closed? Well, students are not attending the schools, but they're not closed. Okay, explain. So I can explain that to you, and thank you, Rick. Thank you for having me, and it's nice to be with uh, Don Wagner, and uh, we're working closely with the healthcare agency of this great county. Um, you know, this crisis has hit with the hurricane force, and um, our, our world is always 24-7, but this has really taxed us in terms of people sleeping because of the fact that we have to serve so many students. There are 500,000 students plus in the county, and we've got over 600 schools. Um, so you can only imagine the kind of traffic that that creates. And I, you're right about education being preeminent, and that is the number one thing on the minds and hearts of people because that's where the dreams are created and the visions are attained. And so naturally, we have to do a professional job at the first order. Um, so. What we're trying to do by extending the instructional day is to provide online learning. And we have been doing this for two decades. So we have the capacity to provide online learning. It's becoming more robust as we speak. We're working with PBS. We're working with a lot of platforms like a Canvas, which is known in, in my world in the K-12 education and even higher education. 
Um, and that's something that we have been doing, but we're now doing more of that. Um, look, to close a school um, or to deny a student the opportunity to meet in a school setting with a teacher is the most draconian thing you can do. It's the most drastic thing to do because we are here to serve students and they need to be in school. They need to be working with a teacher. They need to be uh, engaging with their peers and parents need that type of support. And it is a 24-7 uh, responsibility that we all have. Um, we live to keep schools open, uh, like 24-hour lighthouses. That's what we wanna do. But in this case, because of the social distancing that we've heard about today and we heard from our governor, um, and also the need to practice just good uh, hygiene in terms of communicable diseases to prevent that, um, it has created some challenges for us. Um, so how, how is it working? Um, uh, is there any way to keep, uh, do you have any way of monitoring to see if kids are doing lessons and, uh, you know, how long is the school day, six hours or uh, it, something? It is, uh, it, yeah, it is probably about 305 minutes in the yeah. lower so grades, but it's, it's more than that. Is that they'll the spend up. that much time at home studying lessons, going online? Well, we are trying to um, obviously encourage time on task and trying to match those lessons that would be promoted or be taught in the classroom, extend those to, to the afternoon hours or when parents can meet with students. Um, it's important that they continue with the instructional process, as I mentioned. And so by working with parents, uh, we, we, we have a, a, a newsroom, it's called, and if you want the address, all you need to do is Google OCDE newsroom, and we make posts constantly, probably four or five times a day we're refreshing that. And it's all about what is the virus, how is it affecting your children, what can you do to avert certain things, to avert uh, the disease itself, but also how can you help your children. And then also all of our 27 districts, they do the same thing. So between the work that they are doing as an outreach to the homes and keeping students engaged, what we are doing to do that very thing and to support our districts, um, we're doing the best we can. Uh, is it uh, better than what they might have gotten on the being in their classrooms? No, but we're working hard to stay current with that pace. Might this change in some ways uh permanently how education is delivered. In other words, now people get exposed to online, it becomes a bigger component of the learning experience than it has been until now? Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and it, it has always augmented the instructional program and the day and extended the day. Um, it is getting better um, because of things like this. I mean, we work constantly to keep our kids safe. Uh, many, many uh, surveys have been done and a lot of research in terms of uh, asking the question to parents, what is the most important thing? And that is that my kids are safe. And you know, this could have been an earthquake, let's say, where all of our campuses were shut down. So we need to stay on top of this. And, and the virus has just been another reminder of the need to fortify our communication, strengthen our relationship with parents, do everything we can to keep this great county on top. We're a county that's very respected across the country for many reasons, and uh, that is a place of honor, and we wanna do everything we can to sustain that. Don, Don, do you have any thoughts about education and what should be going on right now uh, with uh, with trying to minimize the, the loss to, to, to kids of a, 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 you know, a, a, a portion of their uh, development? Well, the, the short answer is yes, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Let me though say what I'm trying to do as I do my role on the Board of Supervisors is not play doctor and get in the way of what the health professionals are telling us and I also don't want to get in the way of what the education professionals are saying is what needs to be done. I am uh, thankful for Dr. Harris's uh, recognition that the county and this, uh, the Department of Education and all the school districts have been working very closely together. I am completely unsurprised that this may well suggest new ways of education or may at some point um, um, become more permanent in terms of distance education. That's been an issue in the education community for, for a long time. But, but right now, I'm gonna say the education professionals are 
working in, uh, in close concert, but are also doing, I think, everything they know to do under these circumstances. The problem is the circumstances are so unusual for everybody. Uh, we are all just kind of feeling our way through this, and that's why I want to emphasize we are in it together. We are trying at the county level to get as much, number one, information, and number two, to rely to the extent possible on the medical uh, professionals. They are telling us we do not need to shut down all businesses just the limited ones I mentioned. They are telling us that our vulnerable population, the 65 and older, those with immuno uh, uh, problems that are pre-existing should take steps, but the rest of us need to just be as diligent and careful as possible, um, but life does go on. And I would say that's true to the extent possible in the education community, specific to your question, but in the wider community as well. Yeah, Dr. Meharis, when yeah. will you know schools, schools open again? You know, what, what has to happen or, or what, direct, what directive, uh, you know, do you take on that? Let me, before I answer that, just say one more thing about um, online learning or, or distant learning. Um, the platforms today, there's a plethora of platforms that are very effective. And remember, the kids have devices. So they're, they're, they're not, uh, this is not a foreign idea to them. And um, we have used this for quite extensively. What we do not want to do is to separate the student from face-to-face -face contact, eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball contact with teachers and their peers and with counselors and those people who are outside and community-based organizations that help us. But in terms of um, where we stand now, it's really almost a day-by-day -day basis. Um, it's hard to predict what's gonna happen next I leave it to the health professionals, and it was enlightening listening to them just a minute ago, but the spread of the disease, um, we do not want to uh, create a situation where our students are more vulnerable. Um, we don't want them victimized by this, so we're practicing the social distancing that we heard about up here, and we have heard about that for the last several weeks as well. Um, I think it's gonna be a day-by-day -day basis. Now, most of our schools, have um, our superintendents and board members have agreed to shut their schools for a certain period of time. Fortunately for us, spring break, as you know, is one of those weeks for many of the districts. Others have used, they, they were all using the spring break in one way or another, but they're adding maybe a week or two. The governor did make a comment about hunkering down for the long haul. What we are doing is monitoring that closely uh, I have had the opportunity with, with other county superintendents to meet with the governor, to meet with our state uh, superintendent of public instruction, Tony Thurman, and that is an ongoing fluid relationship. We're on the phone or webinars constantly with one another. So I can't tell you with certainty, he did say prepare for the long haul, but we are gonna take it one day at a time. Our boards are now contemplating uh, when they want to um, uh, you know, look at this again. They've created deadlines that are into like, let's say late March, early April. So the idea that them uh, extending those deadlines may be possible uh, just because uh, the intel, the intelligence that we receive from Sacramento may dictate that. On the timeline issue, if I may, also, the new county health ordinance runs through March 31 of this year, so only another couple of, couple of weeks at most. Uh, there is nobody I'm aware of who says, by April 1st, we're out of this. What it does is it gives us some time to see where we are, evaluate what's working, what isn't working, and decide what further steps need to be taken. Those steps will be minimized if in fact the social distancing that we're recommending is practiced and if the um, uh, folks who are ill are remaining in place. Um, but we are not yet at a shelter in place and I hope we never get there. Um, but, it, but it is, as the superintendent says, something that is going to take some time to work its way through the community. And with all of us working together, we will minimize the pain in the meantime and minimize the amount of time that takes. What, what do you hear from constituents about this? And do you have a, do you have a feel for how people are reacting to this? I, I hear virtually the entire gamut of things. 
I hear you've got to shut down everything, otherwise people are going to die, and it's all going to be your fault. I hear this is overblown, you don't need to do all the things you're doing, and what, are, what about my constitutional rights? Those absolutely span the entire range. Um, the, and the answer to those questions is, I am doing what the health professionals tell me to do and recommend that we do because that's based on the best science that I am privy to and the best medical advice. Um, but I am, I am hearing the full range of those things. We are doing the best we can and as the situation develops, we'll respond accordingly. Right now it's too early to know what is the best course of action. What I am hearing though, just this morning, and I will add this, from the health professionals, from the health department's uh, top guy, was, was saying, you know, you don't need to be tested. If you are feeling ill, stay home. Just like you would with the flu, not that this is just like the flu, but you'd stay home. Just as you would if you had a cold. We know this isn't a cold, but that's what you'd do. We don't know yet the entire etymology of this disease and where, where it's going. Stay home. You don't need to be tested because we're not going to do anything different. We don't have that vaccine yet. Um, and so, so the concern and the worry about testing is perhaps a little bit overblown. If you feel ill, please stay home. Okay. Al, lots of families rely on the schools for daycare, yes. for nutrition. Uh, How's that being handled? You know, we've kept those uh, processes in place. Um, that was one of the things that came out of the executive order by the governor, that we continue to provide free and reduced price lunch for students, and we are doing that. Uh, there's locations uh, close to the campuses where the students can receive that food if they'd like to. In many cases, uh, arrangements can be made. Tremendous volunteerism in this county where people are taking things out to students and their families. We want that to be, uh, that's, that's a sacrosanct process for us. Um, also, there's a lot of groups out there. The churches, some of the large churches have, have opened up their doors for people to come. Now, again, you have to remember that the spacing is an issue. Uh, and with little ones, that's a particular issue because they love holding hands and grabbing each other and they grab their teacher and they grab everybody. So in, in that sense, it's, it's gonna create a different type of dynamic going forward, even coming out of the so-called closure of schools. Um, but I think that um, what we're trying to do is to keep parents encouraged by constant information that is clear, that is simple to understand, and where they get callbacks. And our principles are on top of that. If a parent is perplexed about something, doesn't matter what the language is, we will call them back, we will meet with them. Um, the, the, the notion of technology, almost everybody is online. I think there's a 9% in the county where they don't have uh, on, uh, availability, the ability to, to go online. But in those cases, we have centers, libraries, we have schools or places where they could be churches, a number of places, community-based organizations that can so provide the that. the families right? that need that assistance, the food assistance, daycare, are they getting it? Or is there somewhere they can call if, if they need help. They're they, getting it. it it's, it's being fanned out through the local schools themselves that are in their communities. Yeah. Um, and um, we have uh, a number of outside organizations, by the way. This is part of the Free and Reduced Price Lunch Program, which is a federally based program. But there's a lot of people out in the community, actually, that um, are wanting to help us with food. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's banks out there of, uh, of, of, of places where Food is available, and so we are working hard to make sure that parents understand that. Can, can I ask one, answer or, or address one additional thing that was reminded, I was reminded of by the superintendent? You know, you ask, what am I hearing out in the community? And I, as I say, I'm hearing a full range from you're not doing enough to you're doing way too much. The other thing, though, that I'm hearing overwhelmingly is exactly what the superintendent alluded to. People are responding. They are helping each other. They are recognizing that, that the food banks and, and some students and some of our, our less fortunate and some of our older folks who, who might be sheltering in place do in fact need the help and the community is responding. 
uh, at our press conference the other day, I, I made sure, I said, we are hearing that. I am utterly unsurprised that Orange County is responding that way. Good job, let's keep it up. Okay, gentlemen, I'd like to ask each of you, uh, and this is not something you're dealing with right now, but it's gotta be looming on the horizon, and that's the financial impact that, that uh, this pandemic is going to have on government entities cities going bankrupt, so forth. Uh, uh, you know, is that, uh, how much does that keep you up at night? Well, that certainly would, would, does keep me up at night, but I will say very quickly, I don't think we're there yet. Um, as I watch the stock market uh, sink, and I know the effect that's gonna have on public debt and our, our abilities, I realize that the fundamentals remain there and that the, the hope is, and what I hear from some of the professional, financial professionals, the expectation is when we get a handle on this, the market does come back. People are going to start traveling again. People are going to start going to restaurants again. There may be some changes in the social dynamics, but at the end of it all, we're going to find a way to get back to normal, just like we recover from big flu epidemics, just like we recover from other challenges that we've had. And so uh, is there a financial risk out there? The answer is absolutely. Are there individual businesses that are suffering, suffering greatly and may not make it? Absolutely. Is this economy, economy permanently damaged or damaged for the next decade? I don't think we're there. I don't think we're there. Al, I'll ask you the yeah. same thing. And just so viewers understand, so much of California's tax revenue depends on capital gains, a big portion of it. So if the market goes down, that has a huge impact on budgets with everything closing, sales tax, bed tax, all that revenue's not there. And so isn't that go, anyway, so that, that's the problem. School districts uh, and uh, our budgets impacted too. Right. Uh, how much of a concern is that? Well, obviously, you know, when I hear things like a recession, uh, UCLA announced uh, that this could, uh, that we are in a recession and it could last till 2022. Uh, this is speculation. That concerns me because we're state funded, as you said, and it is tied to capital gains and a number of other uh, metrics are used to determine how we get our money. Um, so in a, as, a, as a county resident and you know, as a family man, I, uh, that, that, that matters a lot to me. But I love the resilience of this county in particular and our state. And early on, uh, people were wondering whether we were still going to get state apportionment for our students because the students were not in their seats, in theory. And, um, you know, because as I mentioned, with, through online learning and other things that we're doing, we're trying to minimize uh, any kind of impact to time on task. But the governor's executive order uh, indicated very clearly that schools would be made whole. So I can rest assured that um, we're going to continue our operations without doing any layoffs or cutting positions that are not mandated by law. Uh, we're just gonna stay the course there and, and that's given us great comfort. I think that's a pretty optimistic uh, note to end on. Uh, Don, you got anything optimistic to end on? I, I, I will end where I was a few minutes ago. We are seeing enormous resilience in this county and we are seeing everybody come together and, and pitch in to help themselves, their friends, and their neighbors. That is encouraging. I don't know how long this lasts, Rick. Nobody knows how long this uh, lasts, but we are a wonderful state. We are a wonderful county. The basics are there. We're gonna get through it. Let's all help each other get through it. Gentlemen, thanks, Gentlemen, thanks so much. much. Thanks again for your uh for your insights and uh, good luck as you're on the ground uh, dealing with this. So we're gonna step aside for another break. When we get back, we'll be talking about business, the economy, and those hardest hit by the virus. And joining us will be Lucy Dunn, CEO of the OC Business Council, Sue Parks, CEO of Orange County United Way, and Harold Herman, CEO of Second Harvest Food Bank. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Orange County's for, uh, Orange County Forums panel discussion on coronavirus. Once again, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, UC Irvine, as well as our event sponsor, SoCal Ga Gas. And now joining me, Orange County Business Council CEO, Lucy Dunn, OC United Way CEO, Sue Parks, and Second Harvest Food Bank CEO, Harold Herman. A lot of CEOs up there. Uh, uh, Sue, you have been a, uh, uh, both an executive and an entrepreneur. Harold, you're certainly an entrepreneur. And Lucy, you have dealt with more CEOs and executives and entrepreneurs than anyone I know. So welcome to all of you. And Lucy, let's start. Uh, first, uh, we're, we're in a recession now. And Orange County has its vibrant business community. Uh, Who's being, uh, who's being hurt? Uh, you know, what industries are getting hit the hardest? What workers are most at risk? Yeah, it's, it is tough right now. Um, I want to give a, a big shout out and a lot of credit to the County of Orange for stepping up to amend their uh, health order and uh, guidance to make it consistent with the state. The one thing we know that our governor does not want is for another uh, Bay Area shutdown of the economy for as long as we can. We need to keep workers employed. We need to keep business um, uh, working. And it, I think it's really important that we balance our personal health issues. We have to balance personal health with economic health. They're, they're married together. Um, and so recognizing that it's very fluid and this could change tomorrow where we meet, may need to shelter in place, but right now we don't. So the businesses obviously in Orange County that are most impacted are hospitality industry, visitors serving, arts, performances. We can't meet in large groups. So by the way, all of you with arts tickets, please let don't count them as donations. Um, don't ask for refunds now. It's really tough for them. Aviation industry tough, but we do know manufacturers. You know when you poll them, uh, over 50 percent or. Uh, 93% of manufacturers polled 50, are at 50% or greater capacity. And the grocery store supply chain, it's solid right now. If we can just encourage folks not to overbuy and just buy what you need because your overbuying helps someone else prepare. So allow those grocery stores to restock the shelves and get out there. And last but not least, of course, want to share you know, our water supply. Un it, it is safe. This is a virus, not a bacteria. So don't be afraid to use your water. Do not overbuy bottled water. Um, I, I know it's kind of a, 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 we feel like we're in control. Well, you can't control coronavirus by overbuying. So it just doesn't work that way. But uh, in general, the best thing about Orange County is our innovation and our entrepreneurship here and the fact that if Remember, we just had a history of a great recession where we did very well. A lot of our industry sectors were able to thrive, notwithstanding that. So I think Orange County will be well positioned because of that innovation and entrepreneurial spirit here uh, and the fact that business, government, and academia work well together, that we'll be able to come out of this at the other end. And I know you want to, I know you want to talk about some uh uh, uh, programs that are available. Yes. I, I know you want to talk about some programs that are available for uh, business, for small yes. businesses, and 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 other, and for employees uh, right. who who may be on hard times. Yes. Uh, but before we get to that, mm -hmm. Sue, uh, give, give, how's it looking? I mean, United Way has a uh, a large number of people in Orange County, basically folks who fall through the safety net who need your help. Uh, are there going to be more folks falling through the safety net? Well, Rick, thanks uh, for having us and having this discussion. So thank you. And the answer is yes, more people are going to fall through. Um, the wonderful thing, and Lucy was just sharing um, some of the great things about Orange County. I think Orange County is a place that has a lot of heart and a lot of people that care. And so I know that by working together, let's say united, by working together united, that we are going to see this through. And I feel that we've seen that so far in coming together. I know one of the first calls I got was from Harold in terms of the food banks. And you know, it's lovely to be able to support 
um, our partner um, nonprofits that are out in the community. But what we're seeing and hearing is that um, people are on, that are or are already in teetering on the verge of homelessness and be living pay, check to paycheck. It's very scary times right now. We're seeing increase in say the call volume to 211, which is the social services hotline here in Orange County. Um, calls, for example, about food insecurity might have been um, 64, like back at the beginning of the month, and on Tuesday it was 646. That's just one example, but we're seeing the same thing in terms of needs for rental assistance and all of the other things. So we're working with all the nonprofit partners to understand what they're hearing, what their needs. We want to make sure we're strategic, but we want to make sure we get help out quickly. So we're worried about the potential of homelessness follow gear up, we're concerned about our folks, our fellow neighbors that are currently homeless and living in shelters. So there's a network through the continuum of care of providers in the county and everybody that works on that system. So we're part of that system and so we're learning what the service providers that are running those shelters every day need to keep that population of our homeless neighbors safe and how they help protect their workers as well. So I think all of us are like not only about who we're helping, but we want to make sure our teams are safe and healthy. So that's a, another concern. Um, we have the, been working with the school districts to understand. We work um, quite closely with school districts in terms of their low-income students and how do we help them if they don't have the technology, if they don't have the resources and they're this close to graduating, what do we do? So we're finding what the technology needs are, how can we can fill those gaps. And then again, try to understand anything else that might be occurring. So all of that being said, I think we're coming together. I know many organizations are stepping up. We have a fund, if anybody's listening, that would love to be part and help us with all those four things. That's at unitedwayoc.org. Come and learn more. Um, and I can talk later about volunteering and et cetera. There's ways to get engaged and there's ways to help. And I know coming together, united, we are going to be stronger here in Orange County. Okay, now when someone loses their, uh, or let's say they're laid off, uh, there, there is uh, unemployment insurance, uh, right? So people can apply for uh, insurance. So that should, I'm thinking that should take care of most of the workforce. But who falls through the cracks, uh, Sue, and might, or, or even somebody who does have the insurance, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't cover all the expenses. There's certain help they need. I'm just wondering, as, as you have to deal with this more, you know, who are the people now, besides all the people you're already taking care of, who are going to need, uh, you know, who are the folks that are going to need help? Yeah, I think of somebody that just called our office on Tuesday, and she's a senior um, who's living on a fixed income. So she's living on a fixed income, and her part-time job to help pay the additional rent assistance that she was getting. Um, was coming through a nonprofit that had to cut back because they could no longer service. So that little differential before she cuts up, she's got a rent and due on April 1. So there's short term and then there's long term. The United Way has been here 100 years or 95 years. Um, so we'll be there in the long term to help rebuild, but we want, need to make sure we're understanding those short term needs. And part of it is just that fear. There's an isolation that's going on for some of our folks that don't know where to turn. And so we want to make sure they're staying connected in whatever way possible. Is there somewhere people can turn? Maybe the United Way provides us in a kind of an assessment help, like here's my finances, here's what's going on, and somebody you know actually looks at what uh, sort of a financial advisor for somebody who's who's uh, down and out. You know, we're helping 200 families right now through that process that we were doing it at school sites. So we're trying to adapt of how we work virtual with them and again, the take, helping them uh, take care. But that is a, an opportunity to do more and more, but those 200 families have a plan. They have somebody that is working with them to ensure that they don't fall into homelessness and their children stay in schools. So those are a program, we, that's our, a program called SparkPoint, but we work with Abrazar and other nonprofits to bring that counseling forward. And those are programs we're making sure are not impacted during this period of time, which is again why we just need everybody to continue to help at whatever level that they can, because we can't afford the programs that are working in the county fall behind when we have to work on getting so many people caught up. But again, we can do this. Yeah. The programs exist. And, and you know, Rick, uh, Sue makes a really good point because not only do we have to um, be very careful about not overloading our healthcare systems, we have to not overload 
our nonprofit providers uh, like United Way. And to that point, um, know that Governor Newsom has issued a number of executive orders right on point with what you're saying, uh, including deferring all ex uh, evictions so people can stay in their homes, that um, if you're caring for an ill or quarantined family member with COVID-19, you can qualify for paid family leave. If you're unable to work, uh, obviously, disability insurance and unemployment insurance claims are important. Um, if a worker uh, or family member is sick uh, or for preventative care, um, when civil authorities recommend quarantine, workers can use accrued sick leave. So there's all of these little lists. Obviously, workers' comp benefits are available if you're, you get the disease on work. And then, of course, delays in filing your state income tax returns by 60 days for individuals and businesses unable to file on time. Um, uh, a number of these things, including alternatives to layoffs for business where you can use unemployment insurance alternative um, workers. So there's lots and lots of tools in the tool chest here. Um, it's just and, and is that uh, that's all in the governor's uh, outline in the governor's? Can somebody go somewhere online yes. that you're aware to a get actually, and to I read think that information? Brilliantly, very, yeah. OC Forum has a number of links that I think they're going to put up. But also, this is why you have a robust nonprofit community like United Way, OCBC, Octane, Anaheim Chamber, Irvine Chamber of Commerce all of your North Orange County Chambers of Commerce, they can all help you access this information at a very local level and connect you with all the right resources. Okay, because that's, I think that's really uh, helpful. Although I, I would hope that uh, no landlord's going, to, it's almost like, you know, it, it's just common human decency. This is not the time to be a victim. Well, you, you know, yeah. there's, it, you, the, it's the, whenever you have something like this, People, there's the best of times. People act in their best ways. And then you always have a few bagged actors that kind of steal the thunder from all of us. But uh, yes, and in fact, even I understand the PUC has issued a ruling that your utilities cannot be shut off during this time. So there's all kinds of things to help folks that are on the edge to give them comfort um, in a time where we're all struggling. Okay. Harold, I can think of no better person on a pan panel like this than, than the gentleman who runs the uh, second, uh, second Harvest. Uh, I, I think everybody now has more of an appreciation of the importance of, uh, of food and groceries, you know. Suddenly it's hitting home to people who in the past never thought about it. You've spent years thinking about it. Briefly, what is Second Harvest and, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is your view of what's happening? Well, first, uh, thank you for the forum. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is we're seeing the best of humanity yes. uh, from our donors, from our team members, from volunteers, from the community. Everybody's pulling together to focus on solving problems and working our way through the situation we now find ourselves in. Uh, we're very much like first responders. Uh, if people don't have food, that's a problem. And uh, we began mobilizing a crisis plan two weeks ago in anticipation of school closures uh, and moved from what was a more bulk delivery program of groups of people working food, serving groups of people uh, to a box program. And uh, we've had to modify many of our practices within the food bank within the last two weeks to accommodate the need that we're gonna see in the days and weeks ahead, months ahead, so potentially. So basically, up, up until now, what have you done? Where does the food come from and, and how do you, who do you give it to and how do you serve it? So the first thing we did is hardened our defense. Food banks cannot fail. We have to support 312 organizations out there, both food banks, Mark Laureate, Orange County Food Bank, and myself are in daily contact with one another. Combined, we have over 500 churches, pantries, uh, senior living facilities, uh, uh, kitchens, soup kitchens, uh, transitional housing facilities, and homeless shelters, and we need to be able to keep food flowing there. The first thing we did is hardened our defense. We eliminated the volunteer experience uh, a week ago and uh, in our building, so we basically see what we're doing as Fort Knox and like a bank. We have to protect the people that can move the food out into the community. So we're literally working four-hour shifts. I had my, hour sh my, my shift this morning packing food. What we're also doing, though, is through donations, we're able to buy truckloads of food. 
We used to do a lot more uh, perishable food than we do today. We began to buy truckloads of shelf-stable food that we can bring to, pa to families that might need a box uh, that would sustain them for a week or longer um, since they can no longer go to the regular places that they might find food if they're, if they're in secure families, food insecure families. But with the, with the closure of schools, all of those families, all of those low wage workers that the hospitality industry, that the tourism industry um, has unfortunately sent home, they're also now at risk. And uh, their children, to impact this even further, are, are now not going to school. And for many of those families, that meal in school was the dependable meal of the week, of the day. And so we have moved into this box program to offset those needs. For the kids' cafe sites that we have where children have been getting after-school meals, we're sending boxes of food, not to the child, but to the family. If that child needed help, most likely that family's gonna need help right now as well. And we've upended and converted our entire delivery system to move boxes to the community instead of pallets of food, although we're still doing that to pantries that are open. We've lost 48 pantries in the last week, meaning they've closed their doors, so the supply is constricting. Uh, but we're working hard to make sure that uh, we keep as much food flowing out. We've purchased, um, at this point, over 20 truckloads of food. We basically did some conversion and assumed that we would need 37 truckloads of food to help bolster our supply over the next eight weeks. Uh, we've lost a lot of food through uh, grocery rescue, which is about 30% of the food that we put out into the community. So what's grocery? Uh, that's food that the grocery stores are giving you? That's food the grocery stores were providing us before um, this uh, situation we find ourselves took place. Oh, so where when, we would, when the shelves are empty, they're empty for you too. They're empty for us as well, but we predicted that and we started to buy truckloads of food to offset that. And uh, you know, I'm happy to report that uh, the donor community has stepped up uh, to support that, whether it's a dollar or more, we've been grateful for, for everything and, have, and with monies as they are coming in, are buying truckloads of food to prepare for the weeks ahead. We've had lots of people that are, that are self-sequestering or quarantining um, seniors that are not coming out of their apartments or homes, in some cases cancer patients that can't get out to get food and don't have anyone to bring them food. And we are literally delivering boxes of food door to door uh, with a harvest brigade, which we launched um, a week ago. First delivery was two days ago. We have over 100 mid-sized pickup truck owners. And for those of you that have pickup trucks that want to join, please go to feedoc.org. You can donate money there. You can volunteer. You can join the truck brigade. We're able to text, message groups of individuals on a 24-hour notice basis to come to our facility pick up boxes of food and get them to those that are in need as we then put them in a cycle of distribution. We've literally been at the ready uh, almost, you know, if we were a battleship before, we we're a speedboat now. Yeah. Are, are you serving more people now? We're absolutely serving more people. Lines are increasing. We've been getting phone calls from um, employers saying I have to lay off you know, 100 people, 1,000 people. I know that, and many of them have been in hospitality, so whether it's been lodging or, or um, uh, the food industry at large, restaurants, et cetera, that are asking us, how can we help support those that might be looking for food assistance in the days and weeks ahead? Um, I think Sue mentioned uh, 211. That's a tremendous resource. And so uh, for anyone that is looking for food assistance, I would go to 211 um, as they are working in concert with us very closely. We're monitoring which pantries are closing, which ones are modifying their operating hours so we can pivot on a moment's notice wherever we need to be within the 34 cities of, these county, of this county to make sure food is still flowing. The truck brigade sounds interesting. Is that volunteer? It's volunteer based. Okay. So we, uh, someone calls us up uh, or sends us an email first through the website. We phone them back. We get their cell phone number and their name. Uh, we basically text dispatch them daily. They show up the next day. We load their truck up with boxes and out they go. Okay. So uh, Lucy, maybe uh, I asked that mm -hmm. because uh, I was wondering, is there anywhere where jobs are being created because of this? Uh, I, I, I got the ping from Uber that right. they'll, you know, they'll, they'll deliver food to the house. I, I'm just wondering if there's uh, somebody who's, you know, got time on their hands now could actually find a job 
delivering or something like that? Are sure, there that, any it, segments? That's a great idea. I, I do know uh, Amazon is hiring, and actually um, all the grocery chains are hiring right now in order to expedite stocking of shelves and the getting grocery that Grocery chains yes, are hiring people. they're hiring now. And so there are opportunities out there that we just need to be aware of. Um, but the most important thing is for those that are least impacted by this, and that's not a lot, but this is where the time where we really do need to step up in generosity to, um, you know, Second Harvest, to United Way, to keep, keep that from dropping out of the bottom. So, yes, there are, there are some sectors that, that actually are hiring. It's yeah, well, you talk about uh, you know doing the right thing. I was thinking maybe that's one more reason not to take that last can of beans off the Thank shelf you, because because you're you. taking it away from the food bank. Absolutely you know? right. I, Please don't do that, people. Please just buy what you need, and everything will get back to normal as quickly as possible. So, Harold, you I'm thinking you probably have an understanding of how the whole food chain works. Uh, is is there enough product for the for the grocery stores? Because when you know I go in yesterday. Yesterday, all the produce is gone except for okra. And I'm, I'm glad I don't mind okra, you know. So I had some okra, but you know, uh, uh, but so so many things are just gone. Are, are they going to come back? Most grocery stores have a three or four day supply of food. We've just taken a run on that supply. The manufacturing sector. Um, can absolutely continue to supply us with food. We know that because we're buying truckloads of it. Even that at times right now is being marshaled by different resources around the country. But the manufacturers that we talk to have capacity to absolutely make sure that there'll be plenty of food at the local grocery store and available to the community. It may take another week or two to get back to normal because we've had this intense run on the supermarkets, uh, but food will be made available again. Okay, Lucy, the federal government taking yes. big steps to help industries, yes. Federal Reserve, uh, small business loans, all that sort of thing. Uh, are there things going on on the local level that businesses should be aware of? Um, well, a couple just on that federal side. Just remember that those extremely low interest rates that the Fed has just, I mean, we're at zero now. That will be very helpful to recovery and ultimately to refinancing debt. So uh, I don't want to discount uh, what the administration and a bipartisan Congress, who would have ever thought that would happen in our lifetime, is actually trying to get stuff done to help people and not bicker. Um, we want to reward their good behavior and say thank you at every opportunity. And our current um, legislators, certainly at the federal level and our own local representation, they're all trying to come up with more ideas to help. Um, we should be giving them those ideas to kind of cut through red tape and gridlock to make it that recovery uh, that much faster. And certainly at the local level, again, I, I just reinforce um, work with those uh, your local business nonprofits, your local chambers, they're there to connect you with the personalized resources that you need to keep your business going. The big guys know this, you know, I mean, you, you, gotta give, you gotta give a shout out to Disney paying their employees during a shutdown right now. I mean, it's, it is amazing what the big guys are doing, but our economy is made up 95% of small business, 95%. So, and we technically don't, typically don't have a state legislature that understands the needs of small business. So we need to educate them now to ramp that up as quickly as possible. What do you think they should be doing? What should the legislature be doing? A absolutely, look at things like AB5, which um, really retooled independent contractors versus requiring everyone to be employees. It's nuts to think of that right now in this economy. To look at, you know, January, the minimum wage is supposed to go up. That makes sense. We need to help our minimum wage folks, but let's make sure we do this right and should we think about deferring that? Um, when people need to retool the, some of our um, antiquated environmental laws, this is the time even the governor is looking at revamping antiquated um, environmental laws that didn't make sense without a recession and really don't make sense now. But, we should be yeah. coming up with a list of those. To go back to AB5, yeah. which seems such an obvious one, it was so controversial when it right. passed. Basically, it, it, it it, it vastly reduced the number of people who can say they're independent contractors, Correct. including Uber drivers Correct. and things like that, and freelancers, Correct. and they are employees. 
and the idea is that we're going to give them all the protections that full-time and benefits that full-time employees have and especially now it looks like it was a terrible law. Right. What are the, what's the, realistically though, politically, do you think there could be uh, a repeal of it? Well, I, I know that, I mean, the, the idea of a repeal is abhorrent to certainly the author of the bill. Um, their idea is to keep adding more exemptions, which is goofy thinking to me. I think that they should sit down with industry sectors, especially now, to figure out a right way of doing this, but um, I, I, we should be asking. There's no question about it, Rick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sue, any, any more thoughts on what businesses can be doing, uh, what uh, individuals can be doing to help out right now? Yeah, so I'm gonna just go with the volunteering because I think when you're not feeling happy or something, helping somebody else yes. lifts everything. It lifts yourself and it lifts the community and there's so much opportunity. Um, Harold mentioned the truck brigade. There is that opportunity. There's um, opportunities to help in the field in terms of food distribution. Um, 211, which we've mentioned, which is the call center, they need volunteers to help with the increase of calls. That's something you can do remotely. That would be a wonderful opportunity. Um, the emergency shelters, Mercy House, for example, they have um, roles for people to play right now. We have a whole list of these community um, needs on our site. Um, I would I think if someone goes to the United Way site, they will see all sorts of things, maybe something right up their alley. Right, exactly. And, and again, as companies are, people are working remotely, having flexibilities, companies in many cases, um, you know, uh, do equivalent matches for employees on their volunteer time. It's a wonderful way to think differently and lifting the whole community up. People need to stay connected in this period of time. That's something that's so good for our souls and it's good for business, it's good for everything. And so I would just say connect in whatever way is appropriate. Take your social distance, but um, dropping off food at somebody's you know, place that can't get out of their house and they can come up and you know, get it, that makes a big, big difference. So anyway, please volunteer and help and just see what the need is out there. Any small part that you can play will lift us all. Turn Harold, as the guy who puts food on the table, uh, give us a closing thought here. Well, we need money. And we need to get more food out there. And, uh, you know, I, that sounds crass, but that's our reality. And as money does roll in, we're buying more truckloads of food to make that happen. Uh, we can absolutely not slow down food to this community, especially when uh, we have unemployment going up and kids out of school. Um, but the closing thought for me is, these are the best of times for us and the worst of times. And the best is, again, the best of humanity. We're at the ready, we've marshaled resources, we'll be able to support the community with food. That's both food banks and all of the pantries working together as a hardened network, supported by organizations through United Way and others and the donor community. We'll get through this, uh, we'll do it together. Harold, Sue, Lucy, thanks so much for, thank your, you. for your insights and your words of encouragement. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And thank you so much for joining us for this event, this live OC Forum YouTube event. Once more, th thanks to our presenting sponsor, UCI, and our event sponsor, SoCal Gas. Remember that this crisis is hitting the most vulnerable, the hardest, and increasing the number of those who are vulnerable. Please consider giving and we'll put two links, two more links up on the screen for you. For pandemic relief for the homeless in OC, there you see the link, uh, GoFundMe site. And you can support OC charities at this uh, link, charitableventureoc.org. Now, if you missed any portion of this program, it can be replayed on the OC Forum YouTube page and it will be posted on the OC Forum Facebook page as well as the OC Forum website, ocforum.org. Once again, that is ocforum.org. Thanks for watching and stay safe out there.